Y'all ever um, notice how when you see something, you see something, whether it's on Instagram or in the world or at a house, you see something and it, it causes a reaction in you or it causes you to feel things that you weren't feeling upon before seeing that thing. A couple weeks ago, actually this past week, uh, last weekend, my mom texted me and she sent an image of something that was terrifying. Two minutes later, my sister texted me from her house and sent me a picture of something that was equally, equally terrifying. My mom sent me a picture of six inches of snow on her patio. And my sister sent me a picture of her and her family in their snow gear shoveling the snow off of their driveway. And I began to become afraid for my future. Because it caused me to remember that for the next nine months, it's going to be painstakingly cold. And we're going to have to shovel snow. I was telling Elizabeth, we were like, you know, we should just get rid of all of our concrete around our house. Pour new concrete with heaters in it so we never have to shovel ever again. Sound good? Y'all in for that? Nobody wants that? Come on, y'all are crazy. Don't lie in church. I saw this picture of snow, and it caused me to be terrified of what's about to come to Milwaukee. What's about to come to Wisconsin? It's more scary than anything we have in the next nine days is the thought of snow. It's not the election. It's the snow that has me afraid and worried about my future. Speaking of the election, we're nine days away. How you feeling? Feeling good, aren't you? Because the reality is we're also seeing some stuff as it relates to politics. And a lot of what we're seeing right now is causing many of us to have a similar reaction to the way I see snow. You're seeing some stuff on social media or maybe you watched the debate this past week, which was finally much more of a debate, praise God. Maybe you saw some of the stuff circling around both camps and you think to yourself, man, I'm really afraid. November the 2nd is coming on nine days from now on a Tuesday, and I have no idea what's going to happen on November 3rd if that guy gets elected or if that guy gets elected. I have no idea what is going to happen to my money or my finances or my security or my future. I'm not sure what to expect because I'm freaked out about what's going to happen in two Tuesdays from now. I'll tell you what I'm going to be doing two Tuesdays from now. I'm going to be eating tacos. Taco Tuesday in my house. No election can stand between me and my tacos. Just saying. We have many reasons, you could say, to live in fear right now, don't we? Everywhere you look, there's just bad news everywhere. There's a lot of reasons we could find to live in fear. Which, which makes me want to speak into for a couple moments how we should handle our fear. Because I, I don't know about you, but you ever met someone who has no fear? By a show of hands, ever met someone with no fear? Exactly. No hands are up. Some of you are thinking in your head, though, you're like, well, Pastor, uh, you haven't met my dad. See, my dad, never afraid. Never afraid. My kids think that of me right now. Actually, that's not true at all. <laughs> they know Dad's got some legitimate fears. We'll talk about it in a moment. But even the, the person you think of who, who's never really showing that they have fear experiences fear. Uh, evidenced by the fact that in, in the Bible, God gives us commands all over the place. I don't know if you've read this, but he's always telling us to do something or to not do something. It's always for our own good that we would listen to the scriptures. But from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the Bible is packed full of commands to not fear. Actually, it is the, by sheer volume, it is the greatest command we find in the Bible. The most numerous command that God would give his people is to not be afraid. And so there's the, all the evidence we need to know that just part of being human means we're going to be met with fear in our future. There's going to be things that come up and cause a reaction inside of us and cause us to start feeling afraid on the inside. And so if we're going to 
have fear is a natural part of life. We should learn how to deal with and handle that fear. But for many of us, our solution when we're met with fear is to just go, ah, the Bible says to not be afraid, so I'm just going to take that fear and not. Just, um, yep, just going to not be afraid. <laughs> you ever notice how when you try to not be scared of something, when you try to not have fear and your goal is to just get rid of it, you often focus more on it and you start freaking out. Recently, um, uh, you know, I've been flying in airplanes since I was a child, and uh, recently something has happened uh, upon takeoff that starts to terrify me. I watched a video one time of a, a bird getting in an airplane engine, and it messed me up eternally. Upon takeoff, I like being by a window, and I like making sure that there's no birds around. Because I like to go up, travel to my destination, and then come down. But birds like to make you go up and right back down, and I'm terrified of that. 32 years old, scared of taking off in an airplane. More than that, you call it, uh, what does the pilot call it? The cruising altitude. You ever heard the pilot say that? Like, we've reached our cruising altitude. You can take your seatbelts off now. I like to call the cruising altitude the altitude of terror. Because you're 5,000 feet in the air, and the plane starts jumping. It's like, I'm going to put the seatbelt sign back on. Why? Why? Why do I need my seatbelt on in this beautiful hunk of metal suspended 5,000 feet in the air? Like, that's going to help me when we fall and crash and ultimately die. Thanks for the water, by the way. The peanuts for my ride and plummet to death. In fact, actually, they've upgraded to a snack mix now. It's not even peanuts. A snack mix, which is quite delightful, actually. I could use a ginger ale, but they're not serving here. Just water. Just water. See, fear causes us to react to a future that we assume is going to be negative. A future that we assume is going to be the worst. Fear causes us to react. And so the solution can't be to just focus on it. See, we had some turbulence on our way to Colorado this year, and I started grabbing Elizabeth's thigh like, you know, like, like the, the, um, the seat armrest was like, you know, wasn't good enough to really grab onto. Elizabeth was just like, you know, I think I bruised her probably. I was just so scared. I looked at her, and I caused her to be scared, and then I looked over at my kids, and they're just happy watching PJ Masks, <laughs> thinking, oh, to be a child ignorant of where we are and what's actually happening an airplane 5,000 feet in the air and we're doomed I love you kids this is the last enjoy your snack mix fear if we focus on it actually puts it into the driver's seat of our life what we focus on is what actually leads us isn't that the truth see I don't think the solution is actually to replace fear because in order to replace fear you have to focus on removing it if i could just get rid of this fear or if i could just overcome this fear or if i could just get past this fear then i could replace it with something that's better but i'm here today to tell you that fear isn't something that we replace in our life rather it is something that gets displaced in our life you can't remove fear you need to get something in your heart you need to get something in your soul that's going to force fear out which is why in first john chapter four the writer tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. You could read that by saying perfect love forces fear out of your life. It pushes it away from your heart. It pushes it out of your soul. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear can't be removed from you. You can't replace fear. You have to displace it with something much greater than the fear. Perfect love casts out fear. You know, there's a moment in the Bible where God is leading his people into the promised land. And uh, Moses has, has led the people out of Egypt through a series of unfortunate circumstances and events. They have to now wander in the wilderness. And 
a new generation grows up wandering in the wilderness, and then Moses transfers, God transfers uh, leadership over Israel from Moses to Joshua, and then Joshua takes them across into the promised land, and they're in the land that he says is flowing with milk and honey. They're happy. They're not eating manna anymore, you know, that little, the, the scrapes of, of goo that they would get off the ground, breadcrumbs or whatever it is, manna, it's called, what is it? We don't really know what it is, but God provided for them miraculously 40 years, and they're probably sick of eating it. They're eating real food now from the land of Canaan. Life is looking good. God says, I'm going to give you all of this land, yet standing right in front of them is Jericho. Jericho was a fortified city, which means it was massive. It was a large city. It was not going to be easy to defeat Jericho. And so here's Joshua standing before Jericho, and God goes, Joshua! Do not be afraid. And you think, how is he supposed to not be afraid? Maybe a little context will help you understand why I have a little bit, I feel a little bit for Joshua. How am I not supposed to feel afraid in this moment? See, we're going into battle, and I don't have warriors. I have wanderers. We've just been walking for 40 years. Mm, very well trained. Very well trained for war. Not only do they not have warriors, but wanderers, they don't have weapons. For what they have is actually gardening tools. You ever see someone come to a battle with like a little spade? Maybe that little three-pronged rake? <laughs> like, don't come at me. I'm going to get you. Don't come near me, right? It's ridiculous. Joshua here standing before Jericho, and God's like, don't feel afraid. Don't be all discouraged. And I'm like, how? This is a ridiculous situation. A bunch of wanderers with gardening tools. Jericho. How is he supposed to not be afraid? But notice, God doesn't say, hey, Joshua, don't feel afraid. He doesn't say, hey, Joshua, don't feel afraid. Discouraged. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Because the reality is you can have fear, but fear doesn't have to have you. You can become, you, you can feel afraid, but not be afraid. You can feel discouraged, but not be discouraged. And the way we're going to get through this isn't to focus on the fear, but rather to focus on something much greater. One of the things we learn in the Bible and through instances like this is that fear and faith aren't all that different than we think they are. See, God calls us to not live in fear. The Bible says we haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of love and of discipline and of a sound mind. And fear, we, we juxtapose fear against faith. Because we don't want to be people who are led by our fear. We want to be people who are led by our faith. But in order to be led by faith, in order to move past our fear, we have to understand what their objective is to do in our life. And fear and faith actually have the same objective. It's called persuasion. Someone say, I'm being persuaded. Say it louder. Say, I'm being persuaded. I want you to catch this. See, fear, all it's trying to do is persuade you. Fear just wants to persuade you that the future you don't know of is going to be the worst. Whether it be the airplane or the election. Or maybe for some of you, it's that significant other. That you haven't found yet. Fear wants to come in and go, yeah, you ain't lovable. You'll never find what you're looking for. Faith, however, wants to persuade you that the best is yet to come. Faith wants to persuade you that what, what, what's ahead of you is God's best for you. And so fear and faith, they're both, all they're trying to do is persuade you. And I'm here today to tell you that God is just better at persuading about your future. For the word faith in the Greek actually means divine persuasion. Our faith is a gift from him. He persuades us continually and regularly through it. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so the way that we become persuaded isn't by tuning into CNN, isn't by tuning into Fox News, isn't by logging on to Facebook seeing what's happening in the world, but rather by logging into this and seeing what's happening in God's word because he persuades me that my future is better in this book. 
And so we can choose the persuasion that we want to follow. Who are you being persuaded by? Who's persuading you? Faith and fear both do the same thing. They persuade us. Fear has an object, doesn't it? Fear always has an object. For some of us, the object of our fear is November the 2nd. For some of us, the object of our fear is coronavirus. For some of us, the object of our fear is an exam coming up or a diagnosis that we're waiting for from the doctor. Fear always has an object. For me in the airplane, the object of my fear was that all of this would be taken away from me. My family, my friends, seeing the Bucks win a championship. You know, we're being honest in church. I have priorities, family, friends. Bucks championships, church, it's in some order. <laughs> but my fear, the object of my fear was that everything would be taken away from me in that airplane. Fear has an object. Fear has an object that's trying to persuade you that it's going to become a reality. However, God is more persuasive than your fear. Because even if something goes wrong, I love this. David in the Bible you know, uh, we often think, you know, what we need to have faith for is even if kind of moments, even if that person doesn't get elected, even if I don't find my spouse in the next two minutes, <laughs> because we're patient like that, even if I'm going to follow God. But David takes it another level. He says, when, even when, even when the way goes through Death Valley, the psalmist writes, Psalm chapter 23, he says, even when the way goes through Death Valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies, even if, even when. And now this is a really important pattern that we must catch in the scriptures. For here it is that we learn that we don't actually fight our fear with removing our fear. We don't actually even fight our fear with anything but God's persuasion. For every time God tells us in the Bible to not be afraid, he actually gives us the reason we can move forward. To Joshua, he said, don't be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord, subject, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Another verse is, don't fear, for I have redeemed you. Fear not. For I am with you. You catching the pattern? Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord who goes before you. Fear not, for I am the one who brings you your help. Do not fear, for it is the Lord who will go before you. Fear not, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, for I am your shield. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Friends, there will always be an object of your fear. But just like that, there will always be an anticipation for your faith. And we can live our life based on an object that the worst is yet to come. Or we can live our life in anticipation that even if and even when the way goes through a valley that I'm uncomfortable with, even if that person gets elected, even if I don't find my spouse, even if my bank account isn't right, even if I'm being persuaded that my future is secure. I'm being persuaded to anticipate something better ahead of me than what my fear can promise. I'm being persuaded to anticipate good. Friends, we have many reasons to live in fear, but the reality is we have way more reasons to count on God. You might have an innumerable amount of reasons to fear right now. But there are even more reasons to count on God. And so my question for us today is simple. What are you anticipating? For, for what we anticipate actually reveals where our hope is. Isn't that interesting? What, what, what you're anticipating actually reveals where your hope is. I don't know about you, but I'm actually anticipating good in my future. I'm anticipating that my future is going to be more peaceful than my present. I'm anticipating that there's going to be more life 
and more health and more light and more joy and more delight because he is the object of my hope. Because I can anticipate who he is in my future. I'm anticipating that there's going to be a whole lot of good to look forward to no matter what date is on the calendar. Friends, I'm hoping that you'll join me this morning in declaring that our hope is not in America. Please, I am pleading with you that our hope as believers is not in America. It's in Jesus. Our our hope is not in Supreme Court justices. Our hope is in the supremacy of Jesus himself and him alone. Our hope is not in politics, it's in a person. His name is Jesus. For for the kingdom of God existed long before this country, long before there were presidents. For the kingdom of God existed through eras where there was the worst of the worst leading countries and establishments all across the earth. And guess what? The church is here today stronger than it's ever been. Why? Because there is no person, there is no organization, there is no leader, there is no dictator, there is nothing in human history that can remove the love of Jesus from this earth. I'm being persuaded that not death, I'm being persuaded that not demons, that not powers of darkness, that not principalities or powers that rule around, that not people, that nothing can come between me and the love of Jesus. I'm being persuaded this morning that Jesus Christ is supreme above every other person, that Jesus Christ himself is far above the angels, that Jesus Christ himself is God in the flesh and came down and gave his life for me so I don't have to live in fear for one more moment. Instead, I can anticipate I can anticipate that what's on the other side of November the 2nd is more good for God and his people. I can anticipate that even though we walk through darkness, I will fear no evil. For my hope is not in any of this. My hope isn't in anything I could see. My hope is in the unseen. I'm being persuaded. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 says to set your mind on things that are above. This is my plea. Over the next nine days, don't set your mind on the left. Set your mind on the right. Let's live above all of that. Above doesn't mean better. Above just means different. This, whatever happens, it'll happen. This is my real reality. This is my true identity. This is my true home. You can take my liberties, but you cannot take my Savior. He goes with me. And so let's ask the question, what am I anticipating? What are you anticipating? He's here. He's ahead of us. He's leading. He's going to be there. What are you anticipating? For it reveals the thing that we've placed our hope in. What's your fear? What's the thing in your life that needs to be displaced by perfect love? For perfect love forces out all fear. Come on all across the room. Can we stand to our feet and just ask God to encourage us? If you're at home watching, we want to encourage you just to ask this question. God, where's my hope? Come on, let's close our eyes. Let's call upon the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that in your name and your name only is their life. God, many of us are coming into this space and this place today dealing with very real fear. Dealing with feelings of anxiety and worry and fear and God, many of us, just to be honest, we're afraid. The future's uncertain, and that's uncomfortable. But we're turning to the one whom is secure. 
And so, God, in our insecurity, in our fear, in our worry, in our sin, in our pride, in our error, in our wrong, come and reveal to us, God, what is the thing that we're putting our hope in that's not you? God, I want my hope grounded in your word. And though what might be being preached around our country is that we're Americans first. God, we declare that I'm a son, I'm a daughter before I'm any of that. My identity is rooted in you. My salvation is found in only you. My life and my future is secure in only you. God, take it all away. All I need is you. Where's my hope? God, and then as you root us in your hope, cause us to anticipate good and light and joy and peace in our future. We trust you, the giver of life, the author and perfecter of our faith. Persuade us this week in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, let's praise him.